protecting against a risk. Penalties now in place to deter all arrivals from India, including Australians who want to return home. The government defends its crackdown amidst growing backlash. Those decisions are made to protect Australians. The Indian government's handling also in the spotlight, with the latest election results now in. Also tonight, more Australians eligible for a COVID-19 vaccination as the rollout moves to a new phase. Deadly clashes erupt in Colombia over tax reform. Will the government push on with its plans? And several months on, Myanmar's dissenting voices continue to ring out. This is SBS World News with Janice Peterson. Good evening. The Morrison government continues to defend its hardline stance on returning travellers from India as anger escalates. Penalties for breaches, including hefty fines and jail time, have now come into effect. India continues to struggle under its COVID caseload and health fears grow by the day. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says the restrictions aren't racist. His health minister says it's to protect Australians. In Firozabad, 200 kilometres south of Delhi, this woman holds on to the body of her late husband <laughs> on the journey home after his death in hospital. For thousands of Indian Australians, seeing the stories like this is becoming too much to bear. This is real, this is very personal, and this is affecting Indian Australian community. So we are worried, we are anxious, and we are in distress. Anxiety growing by the day, with more than 9,000 Australians stuck in the country, about 600 of who are considered vulnerable. Not only banned from returning, but from today face the threat of fines or jail time if they do. A temporary determination made under the Biosecurity Act, one that's been met with fierce criticism. They see that uh, uh, people of a particular type of Australian citizens are being targeted. To single out one group in terms of Indian Australians, uh, our Indian Australian friends should be hopping mad about this and the rest of us should be hopping mad about this too. They're out of control and they're throwing innocent Australians under the bus and leaving them for dead. Those decisions are made to protect Australians, to protect against a third wave, to protect against uh, a massive uh, risk to Australia and made with a heavy heart but without hesitation. Australia isn't the only country to ban travel from the hotspot. The UK, US and Canada have limited arrivals but are allowing their citizens to return home. Australia's decision was set to be reviewed on the 15th of May and in the midst of the public backlash, the Prime Minister's indicated that will now happen sooner. We'll be reviewing it before then too All right, with, okay. uh, with Greg Hunt and the Chief Medical Officer and uh, we will continue to do that. Um, we'll do it you know, this week, we'll do it the following week. In defending this decision, the federal government argues the temporary measure is purely based on the medical advice, advice that came from the chief medical officer. When asked about that today, Professor Paul Kelly said otherwise. I didn't advise anything in relation to, to fines or uh, any of those other matters. But the federal government has backed its position by releasing Professor Kelly's official determination in writing, clearly recommending enacting the law. The Prime Minister is also keen to emphasise the penalties aren't mandatory. I understand the measures have strong sanctions with them, but we've had the Biosecurity Act in place now for, for, for over a year, and no one's gone to jail. Professor Kelly's advice also warns of the consequences for citizens stuck in India, including the risk of serious illness without access to health care and in the worst case scenario, death. Pablo Vinales, SBS World News. And the Indian government's handling of the crisis there is being seen as a contributing factor in an electoral setback for Prime Minister Narendra Modi. There's been a slight dip in daily infections from the weekend's world record levels. But 368,000 new cases were still recorded in the last 24 hours. <laughs> Supporters of West Bengal's ruling Trinamool Congress Party, or TMC, celebrate victory, ignoring state-based bans on election rallies due to COVID-19. A win, too, for India's only female chief minister, who's led West Bengal for a decade. 
जेहेतु कोविड इज माई फार्स्ट प्रायरिटी कोडा बढ़े कदम धरे क्ज कर कोडर जो इमिडिएट क्ज शुरू करते अलरेडी कर Prime Minister Narendra Modi seemed to have other priorities as he fronted multiple rallies fighting for this opposition stronghold. Some analysts see the outcome as part of a public backlash against Mr Modi, who also greenlit religious festivals, the attendees mostly unmasked. And there were all these fantastical claims about how Indian immunity is so strong and we are not like the uh, the, the West who are who are uh, vulnerable to, uh, to to pandemics and so on. The Prime Minister facing fresh criticism after scientific advisers engaged by the government revealed they'd warned officials in early March of the new and more contagious variant taking hold. They say the warnings were ignored. Mr Modi has tweeted his congratulations on the election result, adding the centre will continue to extend all possible support to the West Bengal government to fulfil people's aspirations and also to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. At this cremation ground, a discarded personal protection kit lies where grieving relatives have brought their loved ones. The stench of death is everywhere, including in locked down Delhi, amid critical shortages of beds, oxygen and other equipment and vaccines. When I step out on my balcony, the first thing I smell is smoke. Just about everybody I know has somebody in their family who's sick. And what's really scary is the healthcare system is collapsing around us. Overseas aid continues to flow in. Here, a shipment of oxygen concentrators from Britain. But the Indian government is now asking foreign embassies not to hoard critical supplies. This after the New Zealand mission tweeted an SOS for oxygen to help sick local staff. Rainer Sarampayat, SBS World News. Nearly 6 million more Australians can now receive the COVID-19 vaccination, with the rollout moving to a new phase today. The AstraZeneca shot is being offered to anyone over the age of 50. As soon as the vaccine doors opened for Jenny Warland, she went straight into the queue. AstraZeneca, first dose. She'll look after you. Thank after. you. And sat in the hot seat. Are you okay? Absolutely. I didn't feel anything. Good. <laughs> happy to have it over and done with actually so I don't have to worry and that we can all start living a little bit more normally. Miss Walland is one of millions of Australians over 50 now eligible to roll up their sleeves earlier than expected. The fast-tracked launch, a move that aims to boost confidence in the nation's program. By bringing forward those over 50s we're protecting people and protecting people earlier. It was rolled out today in every state and territory except for New South Wales. The Homebush mass vaccination hub in Sydney won't be open for another week. In Victoria, hundreds waited patiently in line. I'm just hoping that we can open up the borders when it's all done. Health authorities hope people will book ahead but say there are still plenty of spots for walk-ins. Maximum capacity when we are full will be 1,500 people per day. The West Australian Premier receiving his shot today too. As the state races to trace close contacts after the weekend announcement that a hotel quarantine security guard in Perth and his two housemates, both food delivery drivers, tested positive to the virus. The 100 people to whom food was delivered are required to get tested and they are considered a casual uh, contact. WA has previously been criticised for its snap border closures, something that's been avoided this time. Overall, though, according to a National Lowy Institute survey, 65% of us are happy with how the country has tackled the pandemic. Australia is known for its strict quarantine rules, but it hasn't been without some breaches. The most recent involving a Pakistani national who tried to evade mandatory isolation by fleeing a livestock ship that arrived in Townsville from China last week. The man who was seeking asylum here has since been detained and tested negative to the virus. Daniel Robertson, SBS, World News. New Zealand is set to open another COVID travel bubble with a Pacific Island destination, but it's not without restrictions for Australians who hope to find another getaway. We'll have those details later in the bulletin. 
Israel has observed a day of mourning for the 45 people killed during a Jewish religious festival. Dozens of other people were also injured when they became trapped in an overcrowded passageway. More than 20 of the victims from Friday's disaster have already been buried following official identification. Colombia's president, Ivan Duque, says he'll withdraw a proposed tax reform after it prompted widespread opposition and deadly protests. At least six people were killed in the violence. President Duque now says the law will be revised to remove some of its most controversial points, including the levelling of sales tax on utilities and some food. China's carried out an aircraft carrier drill in the South China Sea. Beijing has repeatedly complained about US Navy ships getting close to the islands and occupiers in the region, where several other Asian nations, including Vietnam, Malaysia and the Philippines, have also competing claims. The exercise has been described as routine training and part of the Chinese Navy's annual work. At least eight people have been killed when security forces in Myanmar opened fire on crowds protesting against military rule. The clashes came amid some of the biggest protests in days as demonstrators around the world took part in a coordinated day of action. Three months after the military seized power and the voices of protest are as loud as ever. Crowds had dwindled in recent days, but yesterday streams of demonstrators turned out in towns and cities across the country. In the ancient city of Bagan, protesters donned black to show their opposition to military rule. They were joined by supporters around the world in what was hailed as the global Myanmar Spring Revolution. One of the biggest shows of support was in the Taiwanese capital, Taipei. But while the protests continue, so does the violence and intimidation. Eight more people were reported to have been killed yesterday. Dozens of activists were also rounded up, taken off to an uncertain fate. Meanwhile, the exiled government says it's investigating allegations of sexual violence. We got a lot of uh, complaints and also uh, in the social media, in the news, uh, there's a lot of uh, like uh, sexual assault and uh, violence to the detained uh, women and girls. But the resistance is continuing, with whatever means available. Young people are staging so-called flash protests, quickly congregating and then dispersing before security forces can react. They're also hitting back with homemade weapons. The state-run broadcaster last night listed details of at least 11 explosions, mostly in Yangon. Di tutti responsabili del Myanmar. The violence prompting an appeal from Pope Francis, who urged the faithful to say a special prayer for Myanmar every day this month. Out of sight, but not out of mind. Nick Wells, SBS World News. Coming up next, is New Zealand trapped in the West's diplomatic tussle with China? Jacinda Ardern's frank admission about how differences are straining the relationship. A senior US official's low-key arrival into London, but his comments about a world superpower make an impact. And getting that perfect shot, tourists return to the Leaning Tower of Pisa after a six-month hiatus. Tonight at 7.35, Secrets of the Tower of London. Then go behind the scenes at Gretna Green in Secrets Scotland. And later, 24 hours in emergency. Tomorrow on Inside, baldness. It was bizarre. It was rapid. It doesn't just affect men. How did losing your hair make you feel? I worried if anyone would be attracted to me. Kumi Taguchi meets some brave women. <laughs> you look amazing, by the way. And a few blokes. This is the product of 15 years of hair drugs. Then, on Dateline, women rise up. The country where women's rights are going backwards, but not without a fight. That's tomorrow on SBS and On Demand. 
they walk among us, victims of domestic abuse. We've only just scratched the surface. See What You Made Me Do starts Wednesday 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. Get your Woolies worth with Everyday Rewards. Spend $20 on fresh meat in a single transaction and collect five times points on your total shop. Boost online now. Simply shop and scan your card. T's and C's apply. That's why I pick Woolies. Tortilla pockets are ready for takeoff. And we are go! Launch into mess-free Mexican with the incredible Tortilla Pockets from all Del Paso. Subsavers. The new Subsavers menu just keeps on giving. Pick up one of four delicious Subway footlong subs with a refreshing drink, all for just $9.95. It's value done huge. Subsavers. Subway, eat fresh. Making something for mum really makes her day. For Mother's Day, just come into Bunnings, you can create something. There's all sorts of little crafty things and you can paint it up to suit your mum so that it's got that personal touch. A gift that you've made yourself can mean so much more to your mum. When you do make it, you really put something into it. Mums know, mums love something from the heart. Best gift you can give your mum is the gift that's made with love. Where you find a competitor's lower price on the same stocked item will beat it by 10%. Bunnings Shop at Bunnings wherever you are, whenever you want. No precedent, no frame of reference. As COVID-19 spread across the world in 2020, no one knew what to expect. It's a bloody cruel disease. Personal stories shot in 21 countries. Individual perspectives on the extraordinary first year of the virus that continues to reshape our world. Pandemic 2020, Sunday 7.30 on SBS and On Demand. One is money, money. This is Evie, my nanny. Why money, money you pay me? Up. I think extortion is the word you're looking for. We have money, a sixteen money. million dollar necklace that's begging to be liberated. What do you say? When do we start? Yes. Here we go. Here we go. We'd be stupid enough to steal from Roxanne Waters. I didn't see that coming. The Unusual Suspects starts June third on SBS and on demand. Shocking allegations have been detailed in an independent review into gymnastics in Australia. The Human Rights Commission report found abuse and harassment and suggested ways to prevent it in the future. The second most popular sport for girls aged between five and eight, gymnastics, is in the spotlight with evidence that it's not always safe. The 110-page report acknowledging misconduct, bullying and assault are commonplace in the sport. The report identified a number of systemic factors that cut across all levels of gymnastics in Australia and that create an environment where athlete safety and wellbeing are not prioritised and consequently where abuse and mistreatment can thrive. The release of the documentary Athlete A sparked a global sharing of experiences of abuse and saw Gymnastics Australia commission the investigation. Gymnastics Australia unreservedly apologises to all athletes and family members who've had any form of abuse participating in our sport. There were 138 written submissions of alleged sexual, psychological and physical abuse. Experiences some members of the gymnastics community say go back a couple of decades. Among the personal accounts, my coach displaying unwanted affection at an age when you aren't sure exactly what's right or wrong, by someone your own parents respected. All that mattered was the performance and that your coach was satisfied. And at 40 years of age, I continue to struggle with disordered eating and exercise behaviour as a direct result of my time as a gymnast. More than one in five girls between five and eight years take part. This is also an opportunity for gymnastics to play a societal role in driving gender equality in improving women's participation in sport over their lifetime and in challenging stereotypes of how young women and girls should behave and appear. 
The report recommends action on coaching practices that encourage abuse and harm, with more attention needed to stop potential abuse and neglect. It blames attitudes of win at all costs and the ideal body, which leads to eating disorders. In short, it blamed gymnastics at all levels for not safeguarding children and young people. Gymnastics Australia say it will adopt all 12 recommendations, pledging to drive transformational change. Bernadette Clark, SBS World News. The federal government has asked the Defence Department to review a 99-year lease of the Port of Darwin to a Chinese-owned company over national security concerns. Under current arrangements, Landbridge has total operational control of the port. It was agreed to in 2015 with the former Northern Territory government, but the deal's been under greater scrutiny following the federal government's move to cancel Victoria's Belt and Road Agreement. Defence Minister Peter Dutton told Nine Newspapers that defence officials are reviewing whether the company should be forced to surrender its ownership. Prime Minister Scott Morrison suggested last week that he would take action against the deal if he received advice from the department or national security agencies. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has admitted managing relations with its top training partner China is becoming harder to navigate. Ms Ardern told a business summit in a carefully worded speech that grounds for challenging Beijing are growing. She cited a curbing of democratic freedoms in Hong Kong and the fate of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang as issues of concern. And it will not have escaped the attention of anyone here that as China's role in the world grows and changes, the differences between our systems and the interests and values that shape those systems are becoming harder to reconcile. New Zealand's under increasing pressure from its allies within the Five Eyes Intelligence Network over its stance on China. And handling China's rise will be a key topic when ministers of the Group of Seven Industrialised Nations meet in London. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has spoken out on the eve of the event, saying China's behaving increasingly in adversarial ways. For US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, a friendly, low-key arrival in the United Kingdom. His comments on China before departing Washington far sharper. It is the one country in the world that has the military, economic, diplomatic uh, capacity to undermine or challenge the rules-based order that we, uh, uh, we care so much about and are determined uh, to defend. G7 foreign ministers representing the US, UK, France, Italy, Germany, Japan and Canada last met in person two years ago. I think what we've witnessed over the last uh, several years is China acting more repressively at home and more aggressively abroad. That is a fact. The White House citing competition with China as a key reason for Congress to get behind President Biden's multi-trillion dollar domestic spending proposal. It's critical from my perspective as national security advisor uh, to make the case to Republicans and Democrats alike that this is in the national security interest. 2.3 trillion US dollars for infrastructure deemed profligate by Republicans. These are for things that we don't necessarily need. We certainly can't afford, but they're going to delight the liberal left of the party. The Treasury Secretary and former chair of the US Federal Reserve does not concur. There will be a big return. These are historic investments um, that we need to make our economy productive and uh, fair. But Democrats first need the votes, even the most moderate Republicans balking at the total Democrat spend of $4 trillion. That's the amount that we spent to win World War II. The Republican Party has its own problems, specifically what it stands for post-Donald Trump. Thank you. Senator Mitt Romney, who voted to impeach the former president, repeatedly booed at a state party convention. The chairman forced to step in. Please, thank you. Show respect. Amid America's noisy democracy, the one topic many Republicans and Democrats agree on is China. I think that over time, China believes that it, uh, it, it can be and should be and will be the dominant uh, country in the world. Aspirations that will be front of mind as the G7 ministerial meeting opens in London tomorrow. Through the one SBS World News. U.S. President Joe Biden has marked 10 years since the deadly raid that killed Osama bin Laden with a stirring speech. 
The president used the anniversary of the terrorists' death to again express his determination to bring American troops home in Afghanistan. The remaining 10,000 NATO soldiers will withdraw from the country by September the 11th. Mr Biden says al-Qaeda has been greatly degraded since the US Special Forces raid which killed bin Laden. But Afghan politicians and civilians have expressed fear that the withdrawal will embolden the Taliban, leading to more violent attacks by insurgents. Iran's supreme leader has denounced his foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, accusing him of, quote, parroting the words of the enemy. It comes amid reports of hostage deals and a possible breakthrough at the talks on Iran's nuclear program, which Foreign Minister Zarif is leading. As talks on the future of the Iran nuclear deal continue in Vienna, internal posturing within the country has stepped up. It's been a week since audio leaked of Iran's foreign minister criticising the late General Qasem Soleimani and the powerful Revolutionary Guard's influence on foreign policy. In a live address, Iran's supreme leader finally responded. General Soleimani was assassinated by the US in a drone strike last year. Middle East analyst Professor Amin Saikal says the former head of the Revolutionary Guard was regarded as Iran's second most powerful man and a hero to hardliners. He was also very close to the Supreme Leader and uh, uh, any criticism of uh, General Soleimani uh, would have irritated uh, uh, the Supreme Leader and uh, many of his uh, followers in the country. Next month's general election in Iran is the usual race between hardliners and reformists and countries with a stake in the 2015 nuclear deal want to see a new agreement reached before then. Today, Iranian state TV said a three-way prisoner swap between Iran, the US and UK had been agreed, but both London and Washington have denied the report. I think the news of the prisoner swap is uh, likely to be linked to the current negotiation which is going on uh, uh, about the nuclear agreement and also the power struggle uh, that is uh, happening uh, in Iran. And what would be really the outcome of all this, I think that remains to be seen. So does the claim that the US and UK plan to repay a decades-old debt with interest, supposedly totalling billions of dollars. Rachel Carey, SBS World News. To the Pacific now and Fiji's COVID-19 lockdown has eased slightly overnight with residents of the capital Suva now allowed, allowed to leave homes for essential supplies. But the country's health ministry has ruled out any further loosening of restrictions as another two cases were recorded today. Bags of rice delivered to thousands told to stay home this weekend. Empty supermarkets. The lockdown in the capital Suva, so strict, shopping for groceries was not allowed. Thank you for that reason, uh, Fiji government. This rule eased this morning with supermarkets, banks and pharmacies allowed to open. Now that the markets are open, we need shop owners and customers to avoid turning them into dangerous hotspots for further transmission. Please ensure that physical distancing is practised the warning heated. The streets empty as two cases were recorded, both doctors who were not working in a COVID-19 ward, meaning where they acquired the virus is a mystery. The government ruling out easing restrictions further. We are not considering rolling back the measures for any of these zones until we have a clearer idea of the risk posed to the public. That will require more tests, more scrutiny, and quite simply, more time. But that means an uncertain future for many families whose income has been slashed by the lockdown. Non-essential staff have to stay home and most of those would have affected families without jobs, you know, unemployment and there's of course poverty goes with it. Eh? Communities outside the lockdown zone trying to retain their way of life with makeshift screening for visitors. The temperature temperature the symptoms of the short Regional spread is an issue for Pacific neighbour Papua New Guinea. 
The weekly figures are likely an underestimate of community cases, but they show a trend. COVID-19 is spreading from the city to the villages. More than a third of new cases were recorded in Medang province and Simbu saw a similar rise, more than double the new cases recorded in Port Moresby. The opposition leader wants these statistics broken down further and the details about where the positive cases have been shared publicly. There is no such information available to public so that they can know that, oh, OK, a uh, lot of COVID patients are, have been detected from this area, so we should all restrict ourselves from going there. But health authorities in PNG face a more urgent battle to get the vaccine rollouts on track. Of the 8,000 vaccines donated by Australia in March, less than half have been administered. Lucy Murray, SBS World News. New Zealand will open a new travel bubble later this month with the Cook Islands. A deal's been reached for quarantine-free travel with the two Pacific nations. The first flights are scheduled to touch down on May 17, but the arrangement doesn't apply to Australians who will need to spend at least 14 days in New Zealand before travelling on. And in another positive sign, Italy's iconic Leaning Tower of Pisa has reopened to tourists nearly six months after closing due to coronavirus. The site was closed on November 3 last year after the nation was hit by a second wave. The number of visitors allowed inside the monument will be halved with automatic spaces used to ensure social distancing. Back home and Christine Holgate has escalated her threat to sue Australia Post over her controversial exit from the top job in the wake of revelations about luxury watches. Ms Holgate has issued an ultimatum that she's prepared to proceed with the litigation if the federal government doesn't agree to mediation in the next few days. It's the postal saga that keeps returning to the national agenda. This episode has now morphed, at least in part, into high farce. But the chair of Australia Post maintains the nation is over it. Christine Holgate was a very good chief executive of Australia Post. But I want to be clear, Australia moved on some time ago. Christine Holgate says she was bullied out of her position as CEO after this revelation in Senate estimates about gifts for Australia Post executives. They got watches. What were the watches? They were a Cartier watch. She's accused the Prime Minister of delivering a humiliating question time tirade that she says sealed her fate. She's been instructed to stand aside and if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. Today, Australia Post board member Tony Nutt, former director of the Federal Liberal Party, says he wishes things unfolded differently. By ignoring the short-term politics and the increasingly inaccurate, on occasion completely false and sometimes rather vile commentary, Ms Holgate would be the CEO today. But he acknowledges the political and media pressure. There were very few people in Parliament House that day, uh, perhaps with one or two exceptions, popping over to the National Cathedral to light a candle for the purchase of uh, Cartier watches. Do you think Miss Holgate was owed an apology? Uh, by Australia Post? Mm. Uh, not by Australia Post. Who by? Uh, these matters are still on foot, including issues of mediation. Ms Holgate says she offered Australia Post and the government a two-week window for mediation, which closes on Wednesday, now releasing a statement in response to the government's request for an extension. The legal letter says it's disappointing the matter has not been prioritised, leaving Ms Holgate no option but to consider her legal options. The ball is in the court of the government and Australia Post. This bitter fight continues to unfold, raising questions about corporate largesse and the culture inside Australia Post. At the same time, the business itself faces significant challenges. The drop in letter volumes during COVID is nearly three times the parcels growth. A chairman getting used to delivering bad news. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. An overwhelming majority of women murdered by their partners in Australia are subject to a pattern of behaviour called coercive control. Criminalising such behaviour is on the agenda across the country, but there's debate among family violence campaigners, especially those representing marginalised communities. 
Jasmine doesn't want to show her face, but she wants her story told. He controlled my life and I felt I was completely alone. The 30-year-old moved to Melbourne two years ago to marry a man she met in India who had spent months wooing her. She says once she arrived, though, she felt like a hostage in her own home. He moved me into a room in a share house by myself. There was no TV, no furniture, nothing. He would just come and force sex on me and then disappear. He took my phone and stopped me from having any contact with my family or friends. I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. She says only now does she realise that the abuse was not only physical but also coercive control. Research shows such conduct is the most common element in domestic homicides. A recent review in New South Wales found 77 out of 78 domestic violence perpetrators who killed their partners used coercive control in the relationship. Dr Manjula O'Connor says outlawing such conduct will save lives. The biggest benefit of criminalising coercive control is that the perpetrators will know the uh, behaviours are uh, unacceptable, they are criminal. You cannot hold anyone hostage to your whims. You know, I lived through 10 years of violence that was perpetrated by my former husband, who was also my carer as a disabled woman. But Nicole Lee, whose former husband was jailed for two and a half years after pleading guilty to the abuse, fears such laws could be used against victim survivors. The police were called um, to, you know, take me away under, you know, mental health laws. That's one of my fears with this law, is that, you know, we're painted as nags, we're painted as, you know, these crazy hysterical women, and until we change those deeply embedded community attitudes. We're going to repeatedly um, be met with these responses from, you know, from the system. Nimat Kabutli from Muslim Women Australia, a provider of frontline support services, says criminalising the conduct is only one piece of the puzzle to protect women and children. We need um, a huge amount of cultural reform that supports this work. We need adequate funding for frontline services. We need training for police. We need judicial guidelines. We need to look at specialising courts. But beyond that, we need to look at men's behaviour change programs, community education. Across the country, an independent Queensland task force is consulting on coercive control laws to report back by October. A New South Wales parliamentary inquiry is looking at the creation of a new offence and is expected to report back by June. While the NT government is looking at criminalising domestic abuse and Victoria is exploring options to strengthen its responses, a bill is before the parliament in South Australia. Tasmania is the only state to have legislated against against elements of coercive control in 2004, but prosecutions have been few. One thing advocates from all sides of the debate agree on is that meaningful consultation and training is essential to any implementation of coercive control laws. Lena Vlin, SBS World News. And coercive control is referenced in the upcoming SBS documentary series on domestic abuse, See What You Made Me Do. It premieres at 8.30pm on Wednesday, May 5, here on SBS. A global summit on climate change will bring world leaders to Glasgow this November. It's set to be the most significant meeting since the landmark 2015 Paris Convention and an opportunity to assess the global progress. But with six months to go, some questions remain about whether the world is on track to achieve its goals. It all begins with this stuff, coal, which is basically ancient plants squeezed together over millions of years. When you burn it, you get a useful source of heat, which in fact powered the Industrial Revolution. But you also get carbon dioxide, a gas that acts as a kind of blanket in the atmosphere. At this power station, West Burton A in Nottinghamshire, they've been burning coal since the 60s. There are thousands like it around the world, generating electricity but also changing the climate. Over the last two centuries, a growing volume of carbon dioxide has been released from power stations and factories, vehicles and homes. So emissions keep rising. 
The result of all this is that the planet has been heating up and it's striking to see how scientists have managed to track how that's been happening. This record of temperatures over the last 2,000 years uses data from tree rings and ice cores and more recently from thermometers, below average most of the time but shooting up in the last few decades. But what if things don't get sorted, if world leaders gathering in Glasgow later this year don't manage to turn things round? Well, projections show that the more temperatures rise, the greater the risk of dangerous impacts, with some regions facing more intense droughts, potentially damaging food supplies, and others increasingly struck by floods, especially on coasts, as sea levels rise. So scientists say that action is needed right now. If we just talk about these things, uh, we're going to um, pass the threshold very quickly. Uh, and we, we can do something if we change policy now, if we start flying less, if we drive less, if we insulate our homes, if we cut the coal and go renewables. Uh, we have time um, to make these changes. But already the global average temperature is 1.2 degrees above the pre-industrial level and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change says we should keep the rise to 1.5 or 2 degrees at most. Right now we're still on course for an increase of something like 3. So what can be done? Well, the UK's last coal-burning power stations will close in a few years' time. The end of the coal era in the UK is a really significant step, but it's only one of a great number needed around the world. And to make them happen, the summit is going to have to signal a real change of direction. David Shookman reporting from the English Midlands region. Well, the pace of growth in the country's housing market has eased. Catalina Flores joins me now with more. So, Catalina, tell us what's behind this. Well, Janice, one factor is an increase in the supply of stock for sale. House prices cooled off from record highs in March, but they're still around six times the historical average monthly rate of growth, according to CoreLogic. The latest data for April shows an average 1.8% rise nationally, with the biggest monthly increase in Darwin up 2.7%. Sydney rising 2.4% and Adelaide up 2%. So where can buyers find value? But across the larger capital cities like Sydney and Melbourne, it is really a story about the unit markets offering up a lot better level of affordability. We haven't seen unit values rising anywhere near as fast as what house values have been uh, lifting. But we are expecting housing prices will continue to rise throughout this year and probably well into next year just not as fast as what we've been seeing over the past six months or so. CoreLogic says the most affordable markets tend to be Perth and Darwin, where values are still well below previous highs. Well, Westpac has reported half-year profits of $3.5 billion. That's up 256% on the first half of last year, mostly off the back of fewer than expected bad debts. The strong results lifted its interim dividend to 58 cents per share, but with core earnings down and mortgages and deposits flat, the bank has set a new target to reduce costs to $8 billion by 2024. The cost cutting achieved through branch closures, head office job cuts and slashing the number of products it sells. There's three drivers of that. We want to simplify our business, so we're going to sell some businesses. Uh, we want less, uh, less issues in the business, uh, and then we'll have a more digital bank uh, as we go forward, so we can see uh, less need for our head office because of the digital bank. And Westpac helped to boost our local market today. The Westpac result was a little bit over three and a half billion, better than market expectations. It was expected to be a big recovery with an improving economy. Um, things like mortgages, 92% of deferred mortgages are back to, uh, to normal uh, repayments. The big surprise for the market, the big positive, was the big cost out story and aimed to get costs down to $8 billion by 2024. So by the close, the S&P 200 ended the day slightly higher. Westpac led the market, rising 5%. The big four banks were all higher, with CBA up 0.7%. Premier Investments pulled back after announcing it will pay back the full net benefit of the $15.6 million it received from JobKeeper. And toll road operator Transurban ended slightly lower following a market update. To the dollar now, and it's slightly lower against the greenback, steady against the euro, and higher against the British pound and New Zealand dollar. 
A new survey from the Australian Industry Group has looked at ways to address the skills shortage affecting many industries. 115 companies were surveyed, with trades and technicians most affected. Demand for workers far outstripping supply, with 39% of businesses struggling to fill positions. Professionals, sales and manager roles were also considered difficult to fill, while 69% of respondents said they were happy to reskill workers with on-the-job training. Increasing training for young people was identified as one way to address the shortages. Skill acquisition, so that, that includes continuing apprenticeship supports, the wage subsidies that have been on have been tremendously helpful and um, we think that that success is laying down a very important pipeline um, for skill development over a number of years and that would be a very constructive legacy that could be left behind. But we also believe it needs to be models like that need to be explored and extended through to university graduates, intern cadetships and the like. Meantime, ANZ Australian job ads rose 4.7% month-on-month in April, notching up the 11th straight month of increases, signalling strong labour demand growth has continued post-JobKeeper. Well, the impact of COVID-19 on working arrangements has been profound, with many Australians still working from home around 12 months after the outbreak of the pandemic. New data from NAB has found four in ten Australians are working more from home today than before the pandemic. On average, people are now working from home two days a week, and Victorians spend the most time working from home, followed by New South Wales, while those in the Northern Territory have the lowest amount of days working from home. But not all Australians have had the opportunity. There is a privilege in this arrangement. It's not a right to work from home. It's increasingly a privilege. When we look at the types of people, for example, it's more professional people, more higher income earners who are working from home substantially more compared to, say, unskilled workers who are working from home a lot less, but are signalling that if they could, they would like to work from home a lot more than they are now. According to NAB, those surveyed said the biggest benefit of working from home has been their ability to get work done. And Janice, if anyone asks, tomorrow I'll be working from home. <laughs> well done. I'll be at my second home right here at SBS. <laughs> Thanks, Catalina. Coming up next, storming the field. Outraged Manchester United fans turning on their club's American owners. Plus, a simple solution for wombat skincare. Tonight at 7.35, Secrets of the Tower of London. Then go behind the scenes at Gretna Green in Secret Scotland. And later, 24 hours in emergency. Good documentaries make you rethink the past. What happened? What happened? Great documentaries change tomorrow. I will never forget those screams. Nothing's going to change unless we are outraged. Demand different in 2021. All revolutions seem impossible until they are inevitable. SBS On Demand. Should have gone to Specsavers. Get $150 off multifocals. There's no place like me for your next home loan. Break the bad spell with your current lender and switch to me. Get our award-winning home loan and a wickedly low rate. Speak to me or your broker today. There's a glass and a half in everyone. When we first met, he appeared to be completely normal. They seemed so good together and he really brought her so much joy. 
The monitoring got very intense very quickly. I felt trapped at the time. He didn't want her around anyone. He ended up completely destroying my life. See What You Make Me Do starts Wednesday 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. Tomorrow on Inside, baldness. It was bizarre. It was rapid. It doesn't just affect men. How did losing your hair make you feel? I worried if anyone would be attracted to me. Kumi Taguchi meets some brave women. <laughs> you look amazing, by the way. And a few blokes. This is the product of 15 years of hair drugs. Then, on Dateline, women rise up. The country where women's rights are going backwards, but not without a fight. That's tomorrow on SBS and On Demand. Three people have died and more than a dozen are injured after a suspected people smuggling boat broke apart off the US west coast. Authorities say 30 people were on board in severely crowded conditions without adequate safety equipment. By the time rescue craft arrived, the vessel had been smashed to pieces by the surf. The nationality of those on board has not been released. Australian cricketer Pat Cummins is tonight in isolation in India after two of his Indian Premier League teammates tested positive for COVID-19. Kolkata Knight Riders bowlers Varun Chakravarti and Sandeep Warrior were found to have the virus. Tonight's IPL match between the Knight Riders and Royal Challengers Bangalore has been postponed. The tournament has continued in a biosecure bubble despite India's worsening COVID-19 situation. Manchester United supporters have called on the British government to stop private shareholders from holding majority ownership of English Premier League clubs. United's match against Liverpool this morning was postponed after hundreds of fans stormed Old Trafford. Thousands came to voice their continued opposition to ownership of Manchester United by the Glazer family. Needed to be done, definitely needed to be done. You know, with the uh, Glazers, it's been a, a long time coming. Anti-Glazer banners were held, a sign of disapproval against the American owners. That's all they're interested in, money. You know, that's, that's their only motivation. Emotions escalated. Clashes with police erupted outside Old Trafford. One officer slashed in the face by a broken bottle. Some protesters managed to breach security lines and make their way onto the playing arena. Flares were let off as chaos reigned inside the famous ground. The planned peaceful protest turned ugly. The fans actually on the pitch. Do you approve of that? No, no, I don't approve of that. The unrest is fueled from the announcement of the European Super League when Joel Glazer was named vice president of the Breakaway League. Supporters also claim the owners have taken up to $2 billion out of the club since taking over in 2005. They've not communicated with the fans for 16 years and that leads to this kind of anger we've seen on this level. Former players say it's time for change. It's not going to go away because I don't think they, they trust the owners of this club. Um, they don't like them and they think they should leave. Some reports suggest the Glazers are ready to sell, but others claim today's unrest will fall on deaf ears. These are serious, serious business people. I don't think this will, this will impact on their thoughts one iota. Beyond today now, I think it's a case of making sure that the fans across the country unite to ensure that there is reform in English football. The culmination of 16 years of frustration is not expected to end here. Mike Tomolaris, SBS World News. Socceroos goalkeeper Matt Ryan kept a clean sheet as Arsenal defeated Newcastle. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang scored in his first start for the Gunners since contracting malaria last month. Meanwhile, Tottenham kept alive its hopes of earning a spot in next season's Champions League, thrashing already relegated Sheffield United. Matilda star Sam Kerr has helped Chelsea reach the final of the Women's Champions League. Kerr set up Fran Kirby for their game's opening goal as the Blues thrashed by Munich 4-1 in the second leg of their semi-final tie. They'll face Barcelona in the final on May 17 with live coverage right here on SBS from 4.30am in the East. And large crowds have gathered at Milan's iconic Piazza Duomo to celebrate Inter Milan's first league title in 11 years. Inter now has an unassailable 13-point lead on top of the Serie A table. It ends Juventus' nine-year reign as champions. 
to motorsport and Australian Jack Miller has won his first MotoGP race in five years. The 26-year-old led a Ducati 1-2 at the Spanish Grand Prix. Miller was overcome with emotion after claiming just the second race of his career. I've been on this bloody roller coaster and it just keeps going. It's like one minute I'm crying and sobbing like a baby, next minute I'm just so angry and like, like, like listen, I don't know. It's just too hard to even put into words what, what I feel today. The win moves Miller up to sixth in the championship standings. And Lewis Hamilton has won the 97th race of his Formula One career at the Portuguese Grand Prix. The Mercedes driver took the chequered flag ahead of Max Verstappen, extending his championship lead over the Dutchman to eight points. Australian Daniel Ricciardo finished ninth. Inmates at a New South Wales prison have been busy manufacturing what's been described as a game changer in the fight against skin disease in wombats. These burrow trap doors tilt and pour medication onto the wombats as they enter and leave their underground homes. Four minimum security prisoners used recycled materials donated by the community to assemble 1,000 trap doors. Well, coming up, the weather details and the new scheme that's allowing rural businesswomen to access new markets. No precedent, no frame of reference. As COVID-19 spread across the world in 2020, no one knew what to expect. It's a bloody cruel disease. Personal stories shot in 21 countries. Individual perspectives on the extraordinary first year of the virus that continues to reshape our world. Pandemic 2020, Sunday 7.30 on SBS and On Demand. Get your Woolies worth with Everyday Rewards. Spend $20 on fresh meat in a single transaction and collect five times points on your total shop. Boost online now. Simply shop and scan your card. T's and C's apply. That's why I pick Woolies. When your life changes, your insurance should too. Whenever it does, we'll be here for it. Yui, you insured. Bold is standing out, never blending in. It's unapologetically chunky and never thin. Bold is savoured, never swift. It's plentiful, rich, sensations ignite. Old gold is bold in every bite. Subsavers! The new Subsavers menu just keeps on giving. Pick up one of four delicious Subway footlong subs with a refreshing drink, all for just $9.95. It's value done huge. Subsavers! Subway, eat fresh. Entertains you. Hello, girls. Great drama changes you. He's going down. He's going to take me with him. Demand different. We don't hide. We fight. No matter where the war finds you today, just remember we are still here. Demand different in 2021. SBS on demand.
to the weather details now and a trough and cold front are triggering showers and storms in parts of Victoria, New South Wales and Tasmania. Troughs are causing showers and a few storms in northeastern New South Wales and northwest Western Australia. Showers too in the northeast tropics, eastern Queensland, central parts of South Australia and WA. In the major centres, sunny skies for Darwin. A shower or two coming the way of Brisbane. Smoke haze once again in Sydney. Showers in Canberra. Bit of rain easing in Melbourne. Grey skies for Hobart and Adelaide and a possible storm ahead for Perth. Further afield, partly cloudy skies in Wellington. Fine weather in Samoa. Showers in Nandi. Fine in Tahiti. In Southeast Asia, thunder on the way for Bangkok, partly cloudy in Denpasar, drizzle on the way for Jakarta, cloudy skies in Port Moresby. Let's head further north, fine and bright for Beijing, partly cloudy in Hong Kong, rain on the way for Seoul, cloudy in Taipei, fine weather in Tokyo. Heading west, partly cloudy skies in Beirut, rain to hit Islamabad, overcast in Jerusalem, a few showers on the way for Tehran. To Europe now, fine weather in Athens, Bit of drizzle in Berlin, fine weather in Budapest, showers in London, rain for Moscow. To Africa, showers on the way for Addis Ababa, wet in Algiers, fine and sunny for Cairo, partly cloudy in Dakar and bright skies for Johannesburg. In South America, rain ahead for Asuncion, thunder in Caracas, cloudy skies for La Paz, showers in Panama City and grey in Rio de Janeiro. And for North America, cloudy in Washington DC, some showers ahead for Chicago, foggy in LA, fine and bright for Mexico City. Businesses run by women in rural Zimbabwe are being given a boost by a new solar-powered motorbike scheme. They're being used to allow the women to travel to new markets that were once out of reach. Charlotte Kandenga's chickens are ready for the market and this three-wheeler known as Hamba, which means to go in Zimbabwe, is going to help her take them there. The farmer pays an equivalent of $15 a month with a group of friends to lease the electric-powered motorcycles. She can now sell her goods much further away from a small village. Before I got this bike, I couldn't come this far. Now I sell my chickens and vegetables at a business center that's 20 kilometers away. I can get more customers here and more money, even carry more goods. The bikes are being tested by a local startup that's leasing the motorcycles to women in the community. Our aim was to bring green mobility solutions to women in rural communities because we noticed that women are underrated and they spend most of their time doing the household chores instead of uh, making money and improving their incomes. So we thought that if for the pilot we would test with the women to see if they are going to improve their livelihoods and if the, our product is durable to be used by many other small-scale farmers. The solar-charged lithium-ion batteries the bikes used are charged in here. This is a solar charging station. 18 batteries can be charged in here at the same time. On a good day when there's lots of sunlight, it can take about seven or eight hours to charge a battery. So in the community, whenever someone has a flat battery, they just come in here and swap it for a fully charged one. The bikes, made in China and assembled in the capital Harare, are proving useful in communities with no reliable public transport or tarred roads. Passengers call or send a WhatsApp message to schedule pickup times. The drivers say they can make up to $8 a day transporting people, money that helps make them more financially independent in Zimbabwe, a country where jobs are scarce. Haro Matasa reporting from Zimbabwe. Well, now to the pride and joy of one Russian history buff. Vladimir Vinogradov has opened his home to display his collection of 15 rare vintage pianos. The collection charts the history of piano production from early square pianos invented from the mid-18th century. This French piano from 1852 is one of just a handful like it still left in the world. But despite his love for the craftsmanship evident in the instruments, Vinogradov can't play a single tune. He's happy to leave that to those visiting the collection. Recapping our top stories now, the Morrison government continues to defend a temporary ban on returning travellers from India in the face of a mounting backlash. Health Minister Greg Hunt says the measure will protect Australians. 
Nearly 6 million more Australians can now receive the COVID-19 vaccination, with the rollout moving to a new phase today. And New Zealand will open a new travel bubble later this month with the Cook Islands. The arrangement doesn't apply to Australians who will still need to quarantine in New Zealand before travelling on. That is the world this Monday. Catalina Flores will be back with our another bulletin, our next bulletin. That's at 10.20 tonight. But from the World News team, good night.